God means to be known through preaching like this. God wants to be known for who He is, for what He's done. That's why Paul preached like this, and that's why you should preach like this. Why is it that God means to be known through preaching? That's the central question that John Piper answers in this episode of Light and Truth. This sermon was originally preached in February 1999 to a group of pastors in Kansas City, Missouri. So maybe what I could do this morning is ask the question, why we should hold up the supremacy of God in preaching, and then how? Let me give a brief answer to why. Why should the supremacy of God, the glory of God, the greatness of God, the majesty of God, the reality of God, all the godness of God be the substance of every sermon? Please don't misunderstand me now. I'll put in a parenthesis here. And if you read my little teeny book on preaching, you'll know I, I, I believe this and I say this. You should preach about marriage and divorce and drugs and eating disorders and how to get along in the workplace. But the difference is this. Everybody else is doing that too. What unique thing do you bring to bear here? What unique thing do you bring to bear? And the answer is, you bring to bear God. And you don't bring God down and say, He's relevant. You take these things up and let them get consumed up there in God. You try to help a poor housewife who's just at her wit's end with all these kids and all this work and a husband who doesn't get it, you try to help her not just figure out little routines to make it better. You try to fill her up with God. You try to show her something that just catches her up out of that into God and then send her like a missionary back into those five kids to say, show them God. Unleash on this world five human beings that are ravished with the glory of God. There's a difference. There's a difference here. The reason we should preach that way and make God central is because God is central in the Bible and God is central in God's own affections and purposes. I learned this from Jonathan Edwards and the Bible um, that that most recent book, God's Passion for His Glory, is my tribute to what I owe to Jonathan Edwards and his book, The End for Which God Created the World, which is the glory of God. God created the world for the glory of God. God is passionately committed to God and His glory. For example, Isaiah 48, 9, For my name's sake, God says, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not like silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. You can hear in that text God's passion for God. So the reason you should have a passion for God in preaching is because God's got a passion for God. And you should be like God in your preaching and try to get your heart up into God and His passion for God. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on His name. Make known His deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that His name is exalted. What are you to proclaim? That His name is exalted. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless His name. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations and His marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods because all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. 
Isn't that clear? What our mission is? Declare God is great. Tell me, who else in the world is doing it besides preachers? I mean, if there were 10,000 other occupations that gave themselves to this, I might come here and say, just write how-to books, preachers. I might say that. Nobody's doing this. This is our job. This is why we exist. Or Psalm 4016. All who seek you shall rejoice and be glad in you. All who love your salvation. Take a little survey here. Raise your hand if you love God's salvation. Amen. Thank you, God. Now let me tell you what the rest of the text is so you'll all know what your vocation is now. All who love your salvation say continually, great is the Lord. Not great is your salvation. That's true. But those who love the salvation of God know that they are saved for God. Salvation is an overcoming of our sin by the blood of Jesus that we might be freed to come to God. Jesus is our access to God. And so we say, great is the Lord. The Lord be magnified. That's our vocation. So my answer to the question, why should we preach this way, is because God is this way. God made us for himself. God is for himself. Now let me ask the question, how? How shall we preach like this? And I want to give you a model from the book of Acts. Open it to uh, chapter 13 of the book of Acts. This is a sermon preached by the apostle in Antioch of Pisidia by Paul in a synagogue filled with unbelievers, some of them God-fearers and some of them Jews who knew and did not know, who saw and did not see, who heard and did not hear. How would he do it? And I am going to walk you through this sermon because of it, it just overwhelmed me when I did this for myself, and maybe it'll have the same effect on you. So we're going to start at verse 17, and I'm going to give you this as a model, not of how you preach every sermon. I don't think there is a model for how to preach every sermon, except that God should be in every sermon, and they're big. But here we have one sample sermon, and I want you to get a flavor for the place of God in this sermon. It's a history of redemption kind of sermon. Starts at verse 17, and I'm just going to point out God as we walk through it and then draw from closing observations. Verse 17, it was God who chose Israel. You just follow along. I'll be paraphrasing as we go and you check it out in your versions. It was God who chose Israel from all the peoples of the earth. Verse 17, second half of the verse. It was God who made the people great in Egypt. That wasn't just natural Jewish fertility. It says God made them grow. God made them great. Last part of the verse, verse 17 at the end. God led them out of Egypt with an uplifted arm. Well, if you read, like I've been reading in Exodus these days, from, say, chapter 4 to chapter 15, the uplifted arm of God, and why ten plagues, not just one? Why the drowning in the Red Sea? Why? Answer, because I will make known to Pharaoh and to the nations my glory. It's very clear over and over again. It's stated in those passages. And so here God does it. Verse 18, God bore with Israel in the wilderness or another reading with one slight little single letter change in the Hebrew bore with or God carried Israel like a father carries a child. Guide, sustainer, father. Verse 19 It was God who destroyed the seven nations in the land of Canaan. 
It was his pervasive hand. Oh, sure, they swung the sword. But Proverbs 21, 31 says, The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory belongs to, tell me, the Lord. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory belongs to the Lord. So if you're preaching about the battle, you preach about what? The Lord. Others can talk about the swords and what they're made of and so on. But you can talk about who wins battles. Who wins battles? Get the other perspective elsewhere. Come to this pulpit if you want to hear about why they won the battle. Who won the battle? Because that will make all the difference in how you get up on Monday morning and go about fighting your battles and whether you feel confidence in God. Verse 19, the second half of the verse, it was God who gave Israel the land of Canaan. He owned it. Those nations didn't own it. God owned it. He gave it to whom he pleased. Verse 20, God gave Israel judges. They didn't just pop up. God gave Israel judges. Verse 21, God gave to Israel her first king, Saul. And verse 22, God removed Saul. God did that. We've read about that in Daniel, haven't we? God changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. So he gave Saul and he removed Saul. That wasn't just a political maneuvering. That wasn't just Samuel savvy. God did this. God raises up kings and puts down kings. God runs this world. Daniel 4.32, the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will. God governed that vote. Sin and all. Verse 22 at the second half. God raised up David, son of Jesse. God chose him, a young nobody, slingshot in hand, harp, killer of bears and lions, writer of poems. God chose him, very unlikely candidate for a king. But God is God. and He chooses whom he pleases to be king. Verse 23, it was God who brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. God brought to Israel a Savior. Doesn't was, wasn't some impersonal force that made the time ripe. God saw the time was right and he did it. It says, as he had promised. You see that little phrase? As he had promised in verse 23. Meaning, this was not an afterthought. Way back then, God thought of it, he planned it, he promised it, and now he's doing it because he said he was going to do it. So not only is he doing it, he planned to do it. And this is a fulfillment of promise. He set things up for it and spoke it. Verses 24 and 25, we meet John the Baptist. Of all the things that could be said now about John the Baptist, what's he going to say? I am not he, no, but after me, one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Now think of this. Why those words? Jesus said there's no greater prophet than John the Baptist. No greater man born among men than John the Baptist. And when he comes on the scene, he says, I am not worthy to tie the shoes of this man Jesus. You see the connection there? Here's the greatest man that's been born of women. And that man says, and here's a man and I don't dare touch his feet. Get the message? The message is Jesus is the center here, not John the Baptist. Jesus is big. Jesus, the Son of God, is the center of this story now as he comes incarnate. Verse 26, when Paul says, To us has been sent the message of this salvation. Who's the person behind the passive verb has been sent? And the answer is God. To us has been sent the message. So God didn't just do everything in the Old Testament. He didn't just do everything in the incarnation. He's now doing everything in evangelization. God sends this message. God is sending this message. You may commission a missionary. You may ordain a pastor. But God is sending this message. God is doing this. I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail Against it. So God planned it. God accomplished it. God sends it. Now verse 27. Paul goes out of his way to show that even those who do not know God are doing what God planned. This is an amazing way to word this. It says, for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him. Whoa, slow up. 
because they did not recognize him or understand the utterances of the prophets, fulfilled these by condemning him. What in the world does that mean? You didn't you you didn't mean to say that, Paul. You meant to say they recognized and they read and they knew in the prophets what was supposed to happen so that they joined their wills with his will to bring about his purposes. That's what you meant to say. That's not what he said. He said they didn't recognize him, they didn't understand his utterances of the prophets, and in that ignorance they fulfilled prophecy. So question, who's doing it? Tell me. God's doing it. There's nobody left. The people that are fulfilling the prophecies don't know the prophecies. They're blind to the prophecies. And they're doing them to the letter. Get it? This sermon, this sermon has got a point. God is the point. God is doing this thing called history of redemption. That's the point of telling us that those who fulfilled the promises didn't know what they were doing. Verse 29, same point. Look at this. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. Everything written of him. Everything was written. By whom? By God. Through inspiration. And they were just fulfilling God's designs. As Acts 2.23, this Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. One last verse, verse 30. It says God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead and gave him life. So now step back from that sermon, would you, and just think about it for closing two or three minutes here. What's the point? Why? I mean, when you narrate something that happens in your life, pick out any ten days or any ten years and tell the story of your life. Do you say, God did, 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 God did. And you don't usually talk like that. And if you were to choose to talk like that, what would be the point? The point would be to help your listeners catch on to the fact that God is the central actor here. God is ruling, God is running, and God means to be known. God means to be known through preaching like this. God wants to be known for who He is, for what He's done. That's why Paul preached like this, and that's why you should preach like this. My mission statement is I exist, and Bethlehem Baptist Church exists to spread a passion for the supremacy of God in all things for the joy of all peoples. And that includes everything. If you don't understand that God should be supreme in spelling, you're not going to get this message. And you're probably going to go back to your pulpit and say, well, sounded nice, but back to business as usual. But if you understand that God is to be supreme in everything, including how your kids spell and why they spell the way they spell, then you might get it. And then God might make his way into your preaching with such centrality and such passion and such supremacy that your congregation would be transformed into radical, God-saturated, God-oriented people so that the city would reverberate from their presence. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper will preach on preaching that drinks deeply, the third sermon in our four-part series titled, 
God-centered preaching. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.